following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The title of the lecture of uh, this uh, morning is The Transformation of Energies. This is uh, related uh, with the law of three, that is called the law of uh, the Holy Triamatsikano. And also with that other law, which is also called uh, the cosmic common self trogo auto egocrat, which is the law of the reciprocal nourishment of matter or cosmic units. We uh, always state that any atom is a trio of matter, energy and intelligence or consciousness. We also have to state that uh, an atom is like a vibrometer that emits uh, waves according to its own kind. Those waves are precisely what uh, many times we call uh, the impressions, forces. So, if we uh, put an analogy in this lecture in order to comprehend it, we will say that uh, the human being has three brains or three nervous systems, as we always state. These three nervous systems are the three vehicles for the La of the Holy Triamatsi Canno, or the three primary forces of the universe. The cerebral spinal nervous system, which is the vehicle for the primary forces of creation. The grand sympathetic nervous system, which is the vehicle for the negative forces or secondary forces of creation. And we find the vagus or parasympathetic, which is that system that uh, channels the forces that conciliates the positive en energy uh, and negative energies. 
That's why it's called the Holy Conciliation. So in the human organism, we have these uh, three primary forces of the Holy Triamasicano that in religion is called Trinity. And of course, we have to comprehend and to understand that these are not people or persons or individuals, but forces. When we uh, analyze this, we understand that uh, the nervous system is indeed uh, uh, the system that is between, we will say, the physical matter and the ethereal matter or ethereal body. Because we always state that uh, the physical body is in reality a tetra-dimensional body. And that this physical world that we observe through the microscope and to the telescope, the whole universe, this physical universe, is indeed a tetra-dimensional universe. Unfortunately, there are only few people that can see the fourth dimension of things or of the matter, which is precisely the, the vital depth of the physical matter and uh, the nervous system is precisely that uh, force which is in between as I said into the vital body and the physical body because really the vital body or ethereal body is a thermoelectric an energetic body which has a blue color and uh, that <coughs> reminds me the planet Earth when seen from afar it all, it's also uh, gives a very beautiful electric color blue color which we will say is a, a reflection of the vital Earth or the four dimension of the planet Earth and uh, related with planets we have to understand and comprehend that they also have a nervous system and this is something that in Gnosticism uh, is very important because scientifically of course they uh, few people understand that the planet or the planets are really living entities to comprehend and understand this is very important in order to comprehend the law of the three amazi kamno the law of three which is precisely the three primary forces that emanate from the ray of Okidanok or what in Kabbalah we call the Ains of Ore this Ains of Ore or the ray of Okidanok is also called the Solar Absolute which is the third aspect of the absolute so it is called Ains of Ore or limitless light because it's the first emanation of the unknowable which is called the absolute which is uncreated light so this this Ains of Ore or solar absolute is located in the zero dimension that also we, uh, is called seventh dimension so the ray of Okidanak, the Ains of Or 
the solar absolute is precisely the source of life. from which all matter is sustained. And this is what is called the Cosmic Christ. And this is something that we have to comprehend and to understand because this Cosmic Christ, this Solar Absolute, this Ains of Or, is uh, his center, is everywhere. And its circumference nowhere. And it is because every cosmic unit depends on it. And that's why I started telling you about the three nervous systems of the human organism. Because through, through this three nervous system is how the three primary forces of the ray of Okida and Nuk, or the solar absolute, works in the human organism. And that's uh, very important to comprehend because from it, or from them, we acquire uh, the self-realization of the being. Think for a moment that any planet is uh, an organism that has four kingdoms. Mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and human kingdom. These four kingdoms are organs. Of this planet in this in this case because we are talking about the planet earth but imagine any planet in gnosticism we know that any planet is inhabited by these four kingdoms unless it's a moon which is a dead planet the mineral kingdom is precisely the most important in this case related with this law because uh, yeah. somebody is just fixing the microphone on my throat I was saying that the mineral kingdom is one of the main kingdoms because in relation with the cosmic law of the self struggle auto egocrat the reciprocal nourishment of the cosmic unit in the space, within the mineral kingdom there is another kingdom that we call the kingdom of the metals. We cannot deny that within the in the earth, we find mines or veins of gold, iron, silver, etc. These uh, mines or veins of metals is what we say is a nervous system of the planet. <coughs> it is easy to understand that when we comprehend that in order for us to use electricity in different cities, we use the copper in order to channel the electric energy. Any metal can be used for that. I mean, every metal, in this case, when we talk about the other law, which is the law of the Epta, Para, Parshinak, the law of seven, the law that organizes, we know that the seven metals related with the seven planets are precisely the seven main elements in the earth that channel 
those forces. In order for the planet to have life, is a master that is states, the master Adon, he states that there is no fire in the center of the earth or within the earth. What there is, is metals. Those metals that channel energies, like in this case, I'm saying the example, the copper is charging with electricity. But the volcanoes that we find around the world are mostly close to the waters of the oceans. Because in this case, the water of the ocean has a very important point here in relation with different short circuits during the veins of the earth that melt the different elements of the mineral kingdom and that uh, transform them into magma, which is what, that, what the volcanoes uh, erupt or vomit. In, in reality, it's just a release of energy. So think about this and understand that really the metal veins of the planet Earth are its nervous system. But as we physically have our nervous system, and also we have what we call the chakras, or plexuses, through which we uh, capture energies in order to be physically alive. We know that. Because we nourish ourselves physically in different ways. Through the mouth, through the nose, and through impressions. But also we know that we have chakras in order to capture those energies. So the planet Earth, obviously, also has its vertex, chakras, forces. But the elements in reality that helps the planet Earth in order to be alive are the four kingdoms that we're talking here. So imagine, imagine for, a, for an instance, or for an instant, I mean, uh, the metallic veins of the earth as a different kingdom, or as independent kingdom, that channels the forces of the solar absolute as our nervous system channel the three primary forces of the universe. The cerebrum and spinal nervous system that channel the forces of the father, the grand sympathetic that channel the forces of the sun, and the parasympathetic of Agus that channel the forces of the Holy Spirit, talking in Christianity or in, in, in Christian terms. So obviously, the planet Earth in itself also is channeling these three forces through, of course, the metal veins of the Earth. And this is how the planets uh, themselves sustain in order to channel those forces that are coming from the solar absolute. But every planet in itself is different. It depends, of course, in the intelligence. And the evolving intelligence, we will say, of each planet. This is what in Gnosticism is called Hohat, the intelligent force. For instance, in the Sun, we know that the Sun is not like the scientists believe a ball of gas or a ball of fire. People think that if we travel in a cosmic ship in the space towards the sun, 
when we arrive close to the sun, we will be like uh, barbecue because we will be close to the fire. But in reality, the sun is not a ball of fire. It's a huge cosmic unit that is called sun star, but it has huge, enormous veins of metals, especially gold. And uh, what we see in the space are just the projection of those forces, of magnetic electric forces that are sent from the core of the sun. That we see like flames, as we can see flames in a photograph when somebody is, for instance, taking a photograph of a finger with a Kirlian camera of a leaf. We see just energy around and look like a, a, like a sun. Yeah. We have, of course, pictures there in the internet that you can see in order to verify uh, our statements, which are, of course, out very far away from the science of this day and age. Because we, the Gnostics, we do not admit, we don't admit that the sun is a ball of fire. For us, that is a, a ludicrous statement. The sun is a planet, as this planet Earth is a planet with a tremendous energy. The metal, the uh, kingdom of metals of the sun is perfect. It's mainly made of gold because it's the center of the solar system. And it is the cosmic unit that has to channel directly from the seventh dimension the three primary forces, the Holy Three Amatsikano. Here in the planet Earth, as you see, the four kingdoms are necessary because the law of the cosmic common trogo auto egocrat is a law that receives and gives magnetic forces, electric forces among the planets. Here in the Earth, of course, these laws apply in different ways. When you see, for instance, the mineral is, a, is, a, is an entity or a unit that is fixed. It's placed only in one space and is growing without moving. For every atom of that particular mineral is a vibrometer that takes and gives energy, magnetism, forces. Every mineral in the planet Earth is like an antenna that capture special forces from the moon, from the solar system, from each planet, from the galaxy that we call the macrocosmos, and from the infinite that we call the megalocosmos. So there exist different minerals that exist in order to attract those forces. And that's why the metals exist in order to channel those forces and to give life to this planet. The metals do not exist in the earth in order to make rich the greedy ones that dig and dig the earth in order to obtain the gold or the silver of any metal or the uranium in order to make atomic bombs. Metals exist in the earth for a purpose. It's, a, it's reason. Of course, every living organism on the planet has a different mission. See, for instance, the plants. The plants grow vertically and they are also fixed. They don't move. I mean, they don't move from one place to the other. But if you examine clairvoyantly 
any tree, you will see that it's upside down in relation with ourselves, meaning that the head is in the ground. The hair, which is the roots, who are the roots, going to the earth. And the arms and legs go towards heaven. Sex is precisely towards heaven. The sexual energy of the plants are what we call fruits of the earth. Vegetables, flowers. They smell nice and they taste good. Why? Because the intelligence within those plants transform the three primary forces, the forces of the universe, in the right way. They obey the law. The different intelligences that transform that energy within the trees are not violating the law. And that's why when you enter into the fourth dimension, into those plant kingdoms, you see the elementals, creatures that the Bible call creatures from Eden, from paradise, which is the fourth dimension, who live happily. There is no pain and suffering because they obey the law. Collectively, they do it. And they don't break it. But unfortunately, the intellectual animal, the three-brained centered being in this planet Earth, ignoring that every tree has its mission, because that's why you find different types of trees. In astrology, you find that some trees are related to this sign, this zodiacal sign. This tree is related to the moon. This tree is related to Mars. This tree is related to Saturn. There are trees, plants that are related to the megalocosmos, through the solar system, to the galaxy. They are like antennas capturing, transforming the energy. Their intelligence, that's why I said their head is in the ground because their intelligence is uh, in harmony with the intelligence of the earth. That's why it is like that. But here the intellectual animal takes one tree and make a, uh, you call graft it. You adulterate or well, the scientists of this earth adulterate the trees or the plants by uh, putting one species of tree with another one in order to make, they say, it, better fruits. But if you understand now that the fruits are the seed the, uh, the, or the sexual energy of the trees or the plants, obviously the fruit that you take from a grafted plant it's an adulterated fruit. The sexual force there is adulterated. So the humanoids, the intellectual animals of this planet Earth, are altering the food of the Earth. That energy that enters into the Earth and the Earth takes transforms and sends into the space again through the same organs that it takes it is called a skulking. This is how it is called in occult science. A skulking. A-S-K-O-K-A-I-N. You understand that? A-S-K-O- K I N K as cocking. Obviously, the deforestation of lands is against the planet. 
That's why you find different trees in different uh, areas of the planet, because the planet needs different type of energy in certain uh, areas of, 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 of the land, or, or of its body. Trees, plants that grow in the tropical or in the cold areas of the planet are not there just because accident. They have their purpose. Unfortunately, humanity is breaking. We will say it is violating nature. It's what is called violence against nature. Did you hear that motto in India, Ahimsa? Not violence. Well, that uh, motto is really very extent. It's not only for the human being, it's all for the whole planet. Not violence means not to disturb the laws of nature and cosmos. Not only in the human kingdom, but in the mineral kingdom. Extracting the petroleum, the oil from the earth, is a violence against nature. And the proof is that that violence is creating smog, different sicknesses, because of the ignorance. We can use, like, in other planets, humanities use the solar energy in order to transport themselves in their inventions in vehicles. Of course, they know that the solar energy is related with the law of Triamatsikamno, and the, law, the solar energy can be used. As the plants use the solar energy, the minerals use the solar energy, and also the animals. Let's see now the animals. You see the animals have, they have their ability to transport themselves from one place to the other. In the National Geographic television, and many other uh, television programs, we see beautiful programs in how the, the birds, how the animals, how the fish move to one place to the other. What do you think the animal moves from one place to the other? Why they precisely inhabit in certain points of the earth, like the polar bear in the North Pole, the penguins in the South in the North Pole? Why are certain animals, like deers, with horns, like antennas? Every animal, every insect, capture different type of cosmic vibrations that the earth needs in different areas that's why they move they transmigrate from one place to the other that's why the animal is horizontal it's not vertical like the tree it's horizontal because they have to move even a bird moves horizontally in the air and then to travel to one place to the other. So every species has its particular mission, cosmically speaking, intelligences that are moving them in order to feed the planet. That energy, of course, is channeled for the kingdoms of the earth and transform in the core of the earth, within its metals. This is what is called the cosmic common trouble auto egocrat. This law is fundamental for the surviving of all the cosmic units when it is not uh, break or broken. The most difficult organism that the planet creates or develops through evolution is humanism. We are with the gap of evolution because we have three brains. Human organism is the only organism that channels three primary forces and that can retain its three primary forces and comprehend its three primary forces. Unfortunately, we ignore 
a function of these forces and you need to take advantage of we violate the primary force in our bodies and we also do it or help we will know it's not helping really it's just like destroying the other kingdoms plant kingdom animal kingdom and mineral kingdom all planet now is it destroyed because of the ignorance of this transformation of energies we of course as human beings we grow vertically also but not like the plants because our sex is towards the earth in our head towards heaven this way we have the opportunity to comprehend and understand that's why the human organism is created in this way vertically in order to take advantage of the forces of the earth and the forces of the cosmos on top of our head we have the chakra sahasrara the crown chakra that is related with the space with the forces of the cosmos here in the solar plexus we have that that we call solar plexus that is precisely that plex that put us in contact with nature with the magnetic forces of the earth with animals plants we hear in other lectures that we are always in communication through the solar plexus the telepathic plexus sometimes we meet other people without us knowingly or with us without us knowing it in the brain but this area of the solar plex where we have the grand sympathetic nervous system is the one that attract relationships among humans later on we are acknowledging that in the brain but this is what we call the subconsciousness If we awake, of course, we discover how to take advantage of uh, these forces in nature and how to transform the energies in our feet. We have the chakra of our feet, of our feet, I mean, to put it in contact with the earth. But we have other chakras, other plexus that put us in harmony, in contact with the universe or with the magnetic forces electric forces of the earth when we walk on this path we always hear that we have to practice ahimsa not violence and that's precisely one of the mottos that in order to become a human being, as the Dalai Lama says, you have to work with ahimsa, not violence. To be awakened in order to know how to be in balance with the law of Trogo Auto Egocrat. Because within ourselves, unfortunately, we have the ego that breaks the law violates nature in the mineral kingdom in the plant kingdom in the animal kingdom and in the human kingdom the whole society is a wrong transformation because of ignorance that's the root in other times or in the past, people will, was asking me to talk about mythology and how the Nordics explain the creation of nature in relation with uh, that uh, Wagner 
opera called the Ring of the Nibelungen, which is precisely the myth that tells us the origin of this root race in which we live right now, as the Bible talks about it. When we talk about the transformations of energies, we have to understand that the planet Earth, physically speaking, uh, became physical in this fourth round, which is explained in the ring of the Nibelungen. If you ever uh, saw that uh, opera, you find how in the beginning only is the, the word, the sound, and how the forces of the absolute are descending and finally establishing themselves in the fourth dimension. When you know Kabbalah, you know that the fourth dimension is a world of Yesod. There in the world of Yesod, which is related with the element water, because when we study the tree of life, we discovered that the four inferior sephiroth, Malkut, symbolizes the earth. Yesod symbolizes the water, Hod the fire, and Netzah is the air. So Yesod is the first zine that appears in that opera of Wagner, the ring of the Nibelungen. And you see the three uh, mermaids, onerades, swimming in the water. And in the center of that yesod, you find precisely the goal, the Rhine goal. Beautiful way in order to describe that the nine sphere is in the very center of the earth. And in the very center of the earth, of course, is the vital depth, which is Yasod, which is a sexual force. And the three maidens, or Nereids, so the tree of the Nibelungen, are the three primary forces in relation with creation. Many times, in different lectures, we always start, we always say that Creation is related with a feminine force. But of course, we are not saying that the masculine force is not in activity within the three primary forces. We are saying only that when we talk about the developing in creation, we talk about the feminine aspect. As we call uh, about Eve, Wagner or the North mythology places three maidens. Of course, that brings us into memory the Atlantean epoch in which the planet Earth was starting to crystallize into Malkut or to become physical. And this Rhine goal in the center, which the Bidens or the mermaids are worshipping, in taking care of it is precisely the solar force and that is the solar force that we have of course in our sex because in the final synthesis the three primary forces that we channel in the three brains or three nervous systems uh, crystallize in that that we call sperms and ovums in the sexual center and the sexual organ is that that we call Eve in mythology. But as you see in the beginning of this opera, how the Nibelungen, Nibel, which means mist, comes into my mind also Niebla in Spanish, and the child, Lungen. Nibelungen, 
the child of the mist. These children of the mist, the Nivellungen, are the Atlanteans, which in this opera in, in North mythology are symbolized by dwarfs. Of course, symbol of the developing of cunning. And you find, for instance, uh, in this opera, other symbology which are the giants. Now the giants look like dumb in relation with the dwarfs, according to this myth. But if you analyze and meditate in this symbol of how the forces are descending into the physical plane, you understand that in the time of Lemuria, the life of this planet was not three-dimensionally physical, but more tetra-dimensional. So that life was more in the fourth than in the third. We will say, to a better understanding, semi-physical, semi-ethereal. And those precisely are, that's why you see that the giants are always in touch, in contact with the gods. In this case, the gods that represents the three primary forces, Odin, the father, Balder, the son, and Thor, the forces of the Holy Spirit. Of course, in that opera, is a, uh, they are named in a different way. Wotan. Uh, I don't remember the other names, but uh, are also other names uh, that uh, are given to these three primary forces, intelligent forces. And you also f find the feminine forces, which are the intelligence of the universe, which are being played there in the, in the creation. But these two giants of course, uh, as it is written in this mythology, are the, the, the rest of the final giants that were, because the rest of them were annihilated by the gods, and only two remain. They bring us into memory, of course, the same symbol of, of, of Genesis, about Cain and Abel. And when I say that, I remember that Genesis says, that in that epoch of creation, the children of God, which in this case are the Bodhisattvas, physically speaking, that existed in Lemuria, crossing themselves sexually with the daughters of the men. And they created giants. But these giants that are being explained here is another symbology of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel is just a symbol of the separatism in that epoch in which humanity committed the mistake of not handling the gold, the three primary forces in the right way. If you remember the temptation in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then you understand how humanity was tempted as is also symbolized by that dwarf, Albrecht, I guess is the name, that takes the gold and takes it into the inner layers, because the Nibelungen live, I mean, they live within the inner layers of the earth. That is a symbol, of course, of the crystallization of the waters of Yesod into the uh, world of Malkut, the physical earth. This is how the earth was crystallizing. This is how it symbolized. But of course, it's written that uh, after the fall, as you know, there was a problem with the intelligence of the human being. Because these giants were, of course, stupid. Lemurians, we will say. In which way they were stupid? 
they were more in contact, I said in other lectures, with the internal worlds. They were seeing the gods, but they were not seeing, like the Nibelungen, the physical world, more concrete. So therefore, the Nibelungen, or the Atlanteans in this way, like in the other mythology of uh, the Odyssey, you see how uh, Odysseus says that his name is Nobody. He says Nobody, he uh, cheat uh, uh, this uh, cyclop, which is a symbol of, of, uh, of a lemur, or Lemurian, not lemur, because lemur is, a, is an animal. Right. A Lemurian, which is of course a giant. They were giants. Physically, we would say semi-physical, semi-ethereal. And they were of course transforming the energies according to the laws. But because they fornicated, the gods were in fight against them. And it's written in symbology, of course, in that myth of the ring of the Nibelungen. And you know how Cain killed Abel. Of course, in that opera also you see how one, one giant kills the other giant. In this case, the giant that survives is the most cunning one. That becomes, of course, in this case, according to the Bible, Cain. And that Cain transforms himself into a dragon. And keeps the gold for himself. And then the old drama comes, how to conquer the dragon. Well, that dragon is inside of everybody. Isn't Cain inside of us with that gold? Of course, in the beginning, in the, in the Lemurian epoch, when that giant killed the other giant, when Cain killed Abel, was uh, the form of a human being. But with time, transformed into a dragon, the black dragon. And everybody is wondering, where is that dragon? Well, the dragon is inside of us. And it's keeping the gold. This is why we have to understand that we have to kill the dragon. We have to build inside of us something with the help of the gods. Because Watan or, or Odin is always working there. How to build that, how to help us. And that's precisely how the beautiful mythology explains us how to do the work and how happened, how, how the problem in this planet Earth happened. Because now everybody violates. If you see, even the gods are in trouble. Because many bodhisattvas fell. And the bodhisattvas are the physical, mental, emotional vehicles of the gods. And that's the, the big struggle, the, the, the big fight that is always happening. And of course, the whole planet Earth is now in a big mess. And uh, it is written that when the Humanity at that time ate from the forbidden fruit. When that humanity took the goal of the Rhine and start working with that metal in the wrong way, they were performing, of course, black magic, or what we call uh, 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 the blacksmith in which they want power. They uh, started to transform the energies in their own way. Just for the physical nourishment or for the physical enjoyment. Are you following that? Where are you? Is what Jehovah asked to Adam. That Adam in Lemuria that was made into his own image. Where are you? I mean, somebody asked, so God cannot see the man? Is God blind? 
That reminds me that in the opera, while the giants are building the big castle or the wall of Valhalla, Wotan, Odin, is sleeping. Of course, the being has to self-realize himself and awake. But that wall that the giants were building while Wotan was sleeping is the same thing as is written. That humanity fell and because they're fallen, something was a, a division between the superior dimensions and the inferior dimensions. The gods now live. They live in the in that uh, Valhalla, surrounded by walls. We will say the walls of the intellect, or the walls of the mind, that the giants created because of, of their downfall. But that were created in order to protect the superior worlds. And for the gods to control the evolution in a different way. Because of the downfall. So when Jehovah in Genesis asks, where are you? It's like asking, where is my image? Because a human being was created into the image of God. Where is that image? That is, where is that image that was perfectly transforming the energies and keeping the world in harmony? Which that harmony or that image that was not violating nature? That image disappeared because of the fall. And of course, fear was born because of the fall. Fear because we discover that we are ignorant of many laws. And we were naked, it is written. Coming into my mind, the naked beast. Now, when we see, for instance, everywhere, physically, we are naked, even we are dressed. The image of God is not within because that image that is written that that God created man into his own image is not physical it's spiritual it's internal that image doesn't exist anymore our inner God is always asking where are you looking for his own image that human being that was in the beginning and instead of finding the, his own image, what he finds is a naked beast, an intellectual animal that violates nature. And that's why it's written that when one discovers and hears and understands this knowledge, one feels ashamed because one discovers that it's just what is really a beast. And he says, well, I'm naked. Before my God, I am nothing. So I have to hide. And sometimes we don't want to see the reality of our own nakedness. In 1962, the 4th of February, Between 3 and 4 in the afternoon, the age of Aquarius started. As we always say in our lectures, this uh, Aquarian age started in order to help, in order to assist the few that wants to be assisted. Before the total destruction of this humanity, 
Because as we follow the sequence of this downfall, in which this giant kills the other one, Cain kills Abel and transforms into a dragon, obviously this dragon is, as the book of Revelation says, very dangerous. It's a beast, 666, that is destroying not only the human kingdom, but the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and is polluting the earth. So therefore, the intelligence of the earth are going to erase these uh, dwarfs, we will say, or pygmies. Because at, at least the giants at the time of Lemuria, they were in contact with the gods. But now we are not in contact with the gods. That wall that those giants built at that epoch, symbolically, has been very thick. And we no longer see the gods. And we think that we are isolated. And that we are destroying this earth. But we think that we are the kings and queens of the universe. So therefore, this uh, pygmy humanity has to be erased from this planet and to create a new one. But before that, they are giving us the opportunity with the vibration of Aquarius to transform ourselves. And that's why we are teaching in this day and age this doctrine. And we have to comprehend that the forces of Aquarius, which the master called the Dionysian vibrations, are vibrating in the whole nature since 1962. And uh, we, as physically human beings, are receiving that tremendous vibration through our bodies. In order for, for us to do something, to transform ourselves, to create Seth, or to create that, what we'll say it according to the Nibelungen, uh, Siegfried. We had to, to build or to create a, a sword from nothing. when we know the transmutation of the sexual forces and to find the dragon. But as you see, if you follow, I advise you to uh, see and listen that opera of Wagner, when it is, is showing the creation of this planet and how it is developing and how finally we can conquer and return into our place if we follow the doctrine or the forces. Remember that the ring is always as it is also in the opera saying this, the ring cycle. The ring is really a cycle. Everything that comes into our hand like a ring, that's why the ring is placed in the finger related with the sun because they are related with the solar forces. But we have that ring in the left hand because we are transforming the forces of the Triamazicano in the wrong way, creating for us destruction. We have to create the, the real ring of the gods, which is related with the seal of Solomon or the star of David which is a real gold ring that you receive when you attain the self-realization of the being. It is written that the Master states that the Star of David has six points, which are masculine, and six uh, entrances between the points, which are feminine. So in total, we have 12 rays in the six-point star which are related with the 12 zodiacal signs, or the 12 constellations, related with the 12 apostles, 
or the, with the 12 gods of Olympus that we have to develop in the self-realization of the being in order to return into our level of the image of God. So, in this path of the self-realization of the being, we have to meditate very profoundly in order to discover how not to violate nature. Obviously, the work starts within, inside of us. If we start respecting the laws of nature in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts, then we will uh, repeat that in nature. If humanity in this day and age is polluting the oceans, polluting the air, extracting the metals, digging, making this planet or transforming this planet into a, a huge corpse in agony, the deforestation of the plants, the killing of animals, it is because we ourselves are violating nature within ourselves. We have to control our nature and not to control the nature outside, but to obey the law. The whole work is supposed to study <coughs> the transformation of the energies in order for us to cooperate with nature and not to do it like in ancient times in the time of Atlantis even in the beginning of this root race those uh, uh, priests that were awakened and that they could see the gods or the intelligence of nature and they knew that the energy of Ascoquin is also related with the blood. Because if you study your physical organism, you discover that your heart is the sun of your organism. And the blood is the energy that circulates in your whole organism that carries the energy of the solar force. So at that time, when humanity was, of course, fornicating, degenerating themselves by spilling the sexual seed, breaking the law in different ways, the priests were performing great animal sacrifices. In history, you find a lot of animal sacrifices, not only in the Bible, but in many other regions or religions that still are performing those sacrifices in which they release the blood in different rituals and not into a peace, the forces of nature. When I say this, it's coming into my mind, England. Somehow, England managed to kill a lot of cars with the skills that they were of course crazy and making a big holocaust this is the this is one way to appease the forces of nature with sacrifices it is stated that before the first uh, world war some dervishes from Asia were giving lectures 
and pronouncing themselves against animal sacrifices. They were saying why animals had to suffer the consequences of the degeneration of people. It's better to teach people how to obey the law and how not to violate nature and not to sacrifice animals in order to appease the forces of nature. Because you know, those rituals release a scocking in the atmosphere and this is how the forces of nature feed themselves because the planet is alive. So this dervish, or the dervishes, were pronouncing themselves against that, and finally, many uh, rituals of sacrifices of animals were suspended in the world. But they continue doing the same violence, fornication, adultery, destruction. And then nature needed a scocking, and since. It was not received through rituals because they were suspended and then there were a great holocaust, the first world war in which nature was taken by force but was denied. And then the second world war and of course we disagree with animal sacrifices, we know that the earth needs a scocking in the atmosphere. It needs a scocking in the inner layers in order to survive, in order to be alive. But we are squandering the energy of, of the earth in different ways. That's why when people ask, we, we should pray to God in order to avoid tsunamis, in order to avoid earthquakes, in order to avoid hurricanes. And this is, this is not the way. You can pray as much as you want. Meditate as many as you want in order for one to peace in the world. But nature has to balance. And if we are violating nature, destroying nature in different ways, nature is going to balance no matter what. Nature demands the energy of its main organ which is the human body. That's the main organ of nature, humanity. It's a machine. Many times we say we are physically machines that transform forces. And nature takes us as we are. If we don't obey the law, then nature destroys. Because weather to destroy a humanity which is degenerated or to destroy the whole planet. When a planet dies, it becomes a moon. But this planet still needs to give the six root rays and the seven root rays, two more root races, in order to become a moon. But if the intelligence of nature becomes so attached, let's say, for, to this humanity and do not destroy it, then this planet will be a moon beforehand. And the other two races that has to exist according to the evolution and to the laws of this cosmic universe will uh, stop existing or will not exist. But the sixth root race has to exist and the seventh root race has to exist. Therefore, this humanity has to be destroyed. It's no longer good. The planet needs a scocking. It needs to survive. And uh, if we are destroying the plant kingdom with deforestations, with adulteration of plants, how the planet is going to take the energy from the megalocosmos, from the macrocosmos, from the solar system, from the moon, from the planets? How? If our physical body is degenerated, polluted with many sicknesses, how this physical body is going to be a good antenna? If we are destroying the animals, animals are being, uh, are being killed as well because uh, different parts of the earth are being annihilated. The mineral kingdom, the oceans are polluted. 
So you understand that? You comprehend that? That the whole planet is an organism and we are like cells to this planet. Of course, when every single human being in any planet is accomplishing perfectly with the law of the cosmic common trogo auto egocrat and he is not violating the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom or animal kingdom, that planet becomes a sun which is perfect in all his kingdoms, a center of a solar system. Because every human being is a human being into the image of God. And this is how, in the beginning, I said, if you go physically into the sun, you will find it in a ball of fire. You will find a planet with a tremendous vibration, with a tremendous energy that obviously you cannot handle. It's like when, for instance, you are listening music aloud with many speakers. When you do that, if there is a cat there, what does the cat do? He flies, he goes away because his ears cannot tolerate that. Now imagine our senses. The vibration of the sun is so strong, so powerful, that we cannot endure it. Only the beings that live there can transform the forces. I remember uh, a story of a friend of mine that when he went into the astral plane, he asked his being, my God, my being, please take me to the sun Sirius. You see, Sirius is one of the stars, huge star of this galaxy. And he just jumped in the astral plane towards the space and he said that he was flying towards Sirius because he has an astral body. But reaching the star of Sirius, he felt an orgasm, sexual spasm. And he would walk in, the, in his bed with a wet dream. And then he was telling me, I don't understand. I was going to that. And I felt that. Yes, I said, because unfortunately, you have your animal ego within. And the tremendous vibration that you were receiving in the astral plane were not transformed by your consciousness, but by that giant, which is a dragon. And of course, the dragon is accustomed to transform the forces of the Triamatsicano in the wrong way, so therefore you have a pollution. You have an orgasm and spasm. It's, it's logical. Now you understand why in those stars or planets only gods live. In order to have physical body in one of those stars of the, star, uh, of the galaxy, you had to be a god. In other words, you had to be a bodhisattva with an ego, a self-realized being, a solar man. But we are not solar men. Even if we created the astral body, mental body, causal body, if we have ego, we are not solar. We are lunar. And obviously, the lunar or the moon reflects the sun, but not transform it perfectly. So what is what's happening? When we see, of course, physically here, the sun, we see a ball of fire, explosions. If you develop your clairvoyance, you will see also somebody with anger, with the atomic explosions of fire around. You may think that it's in flames, but it's, yeah, it's in flames, it's energies. But it's not burning. But, of course, it's hurting itself. So what we see here in the planet Earth is a tremendous vibration and magnetism, electric force, of the veins of the sun, which are pure gold. And not, uh, uh, and also other, other metals. But of course, this is something that uh, is uh, difficult to understand. Because scientists in this planet Earth, they uh, say that the sun is a ball of helium, hydrogen, in constant explosion. We don't deny that the main element in the sun is hydrogen, but also we find hydrogen here. 
one day we will understand uh, other laws in order to comprehend what the energy and magnetism and electricity is and how we have to build the Tosoma Heliacon, the body of gold of the solar man. Did you hear that the resurrected masters have solar bodies or bodies of gold? One thing is to create the internal bodies, astral body, mental body, causal body. When you create those bodies, they are called mercurial bodies because it's the crystallization of the mercury that we have in a, in a, in a, in a sexual force. But to place the gold in those bodies is precisely the, the, the higher uh, transformation of energies than any human being can describe. And don't need to place the goal into the bodies, the existential bodies of the being, you need to annihilate the ego. And to resurrect. If you have not solar, golden bodies, you cannot resurrect. Only those that have golden bodies can resurrect. With the ego alive, it's impossible to resurrect. Only those with golden bodies are perfectly uh, transforming the energies and making that planet a sun. But in order for this planet Earth to become a sun, it's a long time, really, because this planet really has a lot of monads, which are failures. It's very rare to find a solar man in this planet Earth. But if you want to find a whole humanity where they are solar men, all of them, any sun, any star, is that. Do you have questions? Yeah. Uh, what about uh, like black holes? How does that fit into that? Black holes. Well, we will say uh, in this case, the black holes will be planets which are dying or stars which are dying or returning, we will say into the uncreated light. That happens not only, uh, I mean, there are many black holes, right? When you see that the energy and the matter is like being swallowed. Swallowed by what? You know, there are many theories, but really the black holes are like, we will say, uh, in the beginning we, we stated that the absolute, the center of the absolute is everywhere. Okay? In the circumference, nowhere. Obviously, this sun, when eventually will disappear, will enter into the unknowable, a black hole. Please explain exactly what oskokin is. Oskokin is the food of a planet. That is the outcome of the mixture of the different energies that are channeled through the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, human kingdom and they are coming from different parts of the, of the space and that the planet transform in the metal in the kingdom of metals within the core of the earth and send it back through the mineral kingdom to the plant kingdom, to the human kingdom, to the animal kingdom and to the space and is taken by other planets this is what is called the reciprocal nourishment of the cosmics, of the cosmic units. So you receive different type of forces as we, for instance, as we human beings, physically speaking, we have our own particular, we will say, as cocking, which is our vital body, which in this case, of course, uh, are different energies that we transform with what we eat, with what we breathe in what we think, impressions. In the end, we transform those forces and create other bodies. So the whole planet itself has that energy in order to create or to transform, to create organism that organisms that will be uh, in harmony with the solar absolute.
Thor being the Holy Spirit, what does his hammer represent? The hammer, of course, is uh, is the cross, if you see. In other uh, explanations, we find that the the hammer of Thor is the swastik, which is that crossing movement. Because really, Thor, the Holy Spirit, is that uh, centrifugal force that is always in activity. That's why uh, Thor creates storms with uh, his hammer, his power. It's the same cross, the swastik or swastika. The cross in movement. Because there are two types of crosses. When, she's, when the cross is in the hand of Thor, it's a hammer, which is, of course, which is also the symbol of willpower. Willpower that we need and then to transmute the sexual energy. And that, is, of course, the swastika, which is that cross that is always rotating, always active. Because the cross of the fornicator. It's not rotating, it's standing over his head without movement. How can you know if you're transforming energy properly? If what we think, if what we feel and what we do is, um, is, is, is a balance, if it's perfectly, if what we think is right, and what we feel is right, and what we do is right, that's precisely the right transformation. But if we are doing something, but we feel in the heart that it's wrong, there's something wrong. Upright thought, upright feeling, upright action. For that, of course, is a, a, a lot of uh, observation, meditation, in order not to violate. Because the whole thing, the whole problem that we have as human beings is precisely that we are violators of the law. To begin, of course, with the sixth commandment, which is, you shall not fornicate. We are violating that law, and therefore we are transforming the gold that we have in our yesod, sexual glands, in the wrong way. Lustful way. Were animal sacrifices always black magic in ancient times, or were they done positively in order to balance nature? When any type of animal sacrifice, whether it's black or white, is always in order to appease the forces of nature. Of course, that's a way, you know, as, as, as another religion says, in order to appease the gods, to please the gods. But who are the gods? Are the intelligence of nature? that can be rough against us when we violate nature. So in ancient times, they were killing animals in order to release their scocking from the blood in order to appease those forces. And uh, later on, they even reached uh, uh, to kill uh, human beings or sacrifice human beings. And in that way, of course, they are breaking also the law because they are appeasing the forces of nature, but another law, which is katansia, goes against which is very uh, uh, difficult. Still in these times, you find in India and many other areas of Asia, and even in America, the so-called voodoo or santeria, in which they kill animals and then to, to have benefits of something. The ritual always works, but you have to pay always if you violate any law. So it's better to sacrifice the animals that we have within. That's precisely the great sacrifice that the gods want. Sacrifice of those animals. Why the other innocent animals that are not yet in our level of evolution has to suffer the consequences of our stupidities. But precisely this is what humanity does. It's precisely, and I remember, I, I repeat again, when I was uh, studying that uh, 
killing of cows in England, I was saying, well, who knows? Who knows? Maybe that's the way that they're trying to avoid that the forces of nature will reach them. But sooner or later, it will reach them. Because that Holocaust, of course, is always against the law. What the gods want, or what God wants, or what divinity wants, is the annihilation of the ego. That's the beast, the dragon that we had to kill. What are runes? Can they be used to balance with nature? Obviously, uh, the Master Samael of Veor delivered to us different practices, the runes, in which we can take advantage of the energies of nature in order to have a transformation in ourselves, to awake the consciousness in a positive way. This is how they say, the runes are a gift of the gods for us, in order to assist us. This is why when people say that God abandoned us to our fate, they are wrong. Because God is God's, and we will re re receive through many ways different practices, exercises, in order for us to, to balance ourselves, to be equilibrated, and only not to violate the law, and only for nature to obey us. Because that's precisely the goal. When nature obey us, it's because we are balanced. And the runes, of course, are the practices of the Nords that help us to balance our psyche. The main rune is the rune Gibur, which is related with uh, swastika. The, the rune Gibur is a cross, but when it's in movement, Gibur in movement is a swastika. And uh, the master always associate that Gibur, rune Gibur, which is a sexual magic, with that word uh, Gibur Altar. Or Gibur Altar, which if you modify a little bit is Gibraltar. The mystery of the stretch of Gibraltar. Or the altar in which you perform uh, your transformation of the forces. Any type of rune is good because it teaches us how to transform the forces positively. Why would a person's inner being allow him to go to the sun knowing he could not properly transform the energy? Well, uh, why does one time when I asked precisely, I went to the astral plane and I said, my God, my, 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 my being, please send me to where I belong. And then the earth opened and I was sent to hell. You see that? Of course, the ego thought uh, I belong to, to heaven. Why didn't my God send me to heaven or, or pull me to heaven? There are many times when I had experiences that he called me and, and I am and talking with him, my superior being. But at that time, when I said, send me to where I belong, and I was sent to hell. And I said, oh, well, I understand. Next time, I don't ask, send me to where I belong, because they will send me to hell. In this case, the individual is asking, please, my God, take me to the, the star Sirius. Well, the God said, OK, you want to go there? Go. But you will see that you are not prepared. How? Well, the, the experience was really rough. But then he understood in, in that, that in order to be there, you need to be prepared. Right? Many people will want to experience heaven, but sometimes uh, uh, those type of experiences, you need to gain them, to prepare yourself. Did he lose any Kundalini from that experience? When you, in dreams, lose sexual energy, of course, you lose a matter, energy. But uh, everyone loses degrees according to the magnitude of the fault. Sometimes, when he's unconscious uh, in this way, of course, he didn't lose anything. Because it's a, it's a way that is teaching. Different is when you do it willingly, whether in a physical plane or in the internal planes. If you fornicate willingly, 
Oh well, then you lose a lot. Do you have any other question? What about the jewelry? If you wear like gold jewelry, will that help channel the energies because it's made out of metal? Internally, always uh, uh, the initiates receives jewelry, metals, uh, necklaces. If you look, for instance, in, in Egyptian uh, mythology or Mayan mythology, you find a lot of uh, uh, sculptures related with jewelry, related with gold. Mummies, for instance, in Egypt, were always uh, fine with a lot of gold. And it's because there is an occult symbolism or procedure to preserve bodies for something that people ignore. And the gold, of course, is something very important in these cases. Nemasi Samael talks about the mummies, for instance. Most of the mummies were uh, uh, always fine with a lot of gold. And sometimes the gold is placed when the mummy is dead inside the, the cavity of the heart. And it is because the mummies were preserved by ancient initiates in Egypt with the objective of getting those forces of those mummies in future bodies according to the law of reincarnation and to acquire the same wisdom in order to help humanity. There are two types of mummies, alive and dead. The dead the mummies are being found by many archaeologists, but the mummies that are alive, meaning that the viscera of those mummies are not out of the body, are within, and they are alive, preserved for the future, according to initiation, in order to uh, have a type of reincarnation that is unknowable for this uh, human race. Something secret. The Master Samael talks about his mummy, his, which is alive, that he was using, or he probably is using now. Related to the earlier story about the astral plane, is that one reason that we sleep in the astral? Because we lose a lot of energy to get there and don't have enough to replace it. Obviously, in order to be consciously in the astral plane, <clears throat> we need to save a lot of emotional energies. And for that, we have to control our grand sympathetic nervous system in order to not to be angry or to be jealous or to be fearful, or with hate. You know, all of those uh, egos related with uh, this area of the heart, fear, jealousy, anger, pride, self-esteem, self-importance, hatred, whatever, all of those egos steal a lot of energy of the emotional center. And that's why it's important to love our enemies by transforming the negative forces of our fellow man through meditation in order to save energies, in order to awake in the astral plane. Hello? Yeah. How does the mantra cream or clean help during the Pankatatva ritual? This helps to balance energy as well? Well, the mantra cream is a mantra that I utilize in order to extract the energies of what we're eating and to place them not only in the physical body but in the vital body, in the astral body, in the mental body and even to God. That's why it is written that when we eat, it has to be like a ritual. Mostly when we eat, we have to remember God and to pronounce the mantra and cream in order for that energy to go directly to the higher level of the seventh body. So the human being has to be nurtured in the seven bodies. And that's why we say, if you eat a grafted fruit, you are only feeding your physical body. 
because an adulterated fruit has no uh, it has not the energy necessary for the astral body, for the mental body, for the causal body, for the spiritual body. And that's why humanity, when it eats uh, this type of fruit, loses its morals because uh, it's not feeding uh, his heart, his head, only his, his physical body. How the abuses the planet affect our well uh, <clears throat> in this day and age you need to be careful in order to as i said in order to to find the right food in order to nourish not only your physical body but your internal bodies to select fruit that is not adulterated and to know how to feed yourself because obviously the outcome of that transformation of energies or what you eat, breed, etc., will become sperm, an ovum. And that's why we had to go, if we live in cities, once in a while, go into the forest, into, into the sea, into the river, in order to, uh, to breed the prana, the energy, the solar force. In order for us to have a good sperm, because uh, the quality of sperm in ovum is precisely what uh, builds uh, solar bodies. So is food from health food stores safe, or should we try to eat food from health food stores? What about organic foods, and are nectarines grafted? Nectarines, that's garbage. I like tangerines. Nectarines are just the outcome of some crossing, is what I know, right? When I go to supermarket, I buy only, only, only fruit that has seed. Right, like natural apples, natural tangerines, natural oranges, fruit, or something that is not grafted. Unfortunately, in this day and age, there's abundant uh, the type of food that is uh, crossed or grafted, and that is abundant in the supermarkets. Even then, they call it organic. All this is grafted, but was grown organically. So, it's garbage. Because it's organic, it doesn't mean that it's, it's not adulterated. Yeah, right? it's still good for the digestion, just for the well, uh, Sometimes, if you are invited to a party and uh, they're serving that type of food, well, you have to eat it. You don't have to be uh, discourteous. Right? Eat it because there is nothing there. But if you buy your food, choose the best. Right? doesn't matter if it's grafted is bad the fruit that is grafted if you take the seed and plant it it doesn't grow any other plant that's the clue it's a dead seed because it's already adulterated so the transformation of energies starts of being aware of what we eat because our stomach is going to transform the food into energies hmm? and we need those energies not only physically for the, for the physical body but for the astral body for the mental body for the spirit if you don't food i mean if you don't feed yourselves in that way little by little you will lose your morals is what happens in day and age people feed themselves with canned food for everything so then they lose their shame they're showing their sexual organs and there's a lot of uh, degeneration, sexually speaking. They have no shame to, to show their sexual organs because the type of food that they uh, are eating are not feeding uh, their own uh, uh, inner spiritual forces. Well, you remember the Last Supper? Right. When Jesus was distributing his solar force through the wine and bread of the Eucharist? That's precisely a symbol of how we have to eat 
every, 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 every way that we need to have to be a ceremony in order to, uh, to take the energy. Unfortunately, in this day and age, you go to a restaurant and maybe the, uh, the chef or the cook is, 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 is uh, angry making the, the food out because he has to work or sick. And obviously, uh, that is the food is impregnated with the vibrations of the people that cook it. That's why you have to prefer always cook yourself and be happy when you're doing it. It's, it's, you cannot compare the food that is made in your home with a restaurant when people are just making it because they need to make money, right? It's rare to find a place where you say, oh, this cook is really making food with love, right? Most of the time they said, ah, they're just sick and tired of working and just seeing the, the clock because they want to leave. And then you eat desperation or impatience. And what about, oh, I don't want to talk about it because sometimes when, you, when I see the cook and I see how degenerated this person is, I say, I don't have to be, a, how you call, a prejudiced. But if he really or she really is not, or is, I, I mean, a violator against nature, sexually speaking, the worst of them, I don't eat. I prefer to starve. Because food is impregnated always with forces. As I said, one time somebody asked me, do you eat pork? Of course, pork is bad. But what about you have, for instance, you are in the Sahara Desert, one week without eating, and somebody comes in and offers you pork. Oh, I will eat all of them. Because I'm starving for one week. You don't have to be fanatic. But after that, I don't eat anymore. Because you have to survive as well. And if you're going to die because the only food that I'm giving you is pork, well, what can you do? But if you have the way to choose and to reject that, then you do it. Besides that, I mean, I am not in the Sahara Desert yet, so what I have to worry about that? Right? So is it best to just grow your own fruits and vegetables? Well, if you can do it, do it. You have your orchard there and, and, and grow your vegetables and fruits, do it. But who is going to do it? So if angry vibrations negatively charge your food, can you play Beethoven when making your steak to make it better? Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Yeah, of course, classical music is always good. You have to be in good mood. Remember that you are impregnating the food with what, your mood. That's why when you see your wife that is cooking for you, if she's happy, you say, oh, I want to eat. But she, but she is angry there. I said, mm -mm. I'm going to take that poison into my body too. So you just go and relax her, massage her, right? When, he, when she's cooking, kiss her, and then she will be happy cooking. And then you eat and then you take good food. Right? <laughs> ha ha ha. <laughs> well, my friends, I hope this lecture helped you to understand that everything is alive and has intelligence. And if we interfer, uh, interfere in the intelligence of nature and the cosmos, when it comes into the earth, obviously uh, we are going to damage ourselves hurt ourselves right. and we are going to, to, to hurt the, the planet as that cat is being hurt right now. Okay, there are no other questions, thank you very much and the uh, next lecture will be all added to it of course in order to you to understand the sequence of the transformation of energies. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? 
Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.